Welcome to our stage, Mr. Kyle Shannon, to tell us everything we need to know about AI. On my first day of seventh grade in 1977, it makes me 57, you don't have to do the math. <laughs> I walked into a classroom and on every desk was a personal computer. Now, this wasn't the room, but it looked a lot like this. Midjourney created this. I described the room that I took that class in and it created that. What was actually on the desks were Radio Shack TRS-80s. And I learned to do basic programming. The first thing we learned to do was print a character to screen, L print to screen. And my buddy Scott and I, we created an animated rocket that took off and plumes went in ASCII and it was magic. And the more I learned about this machine, the more I realized how revolutionary it was, that this was kind of like the printing press level cool. This was amazing. And I also recognized that I was just too young to be this guy or that guy. I had just missed being in that group. And it broke my heart. It really did. Because it was like, I knew this was, you know, once in a generation kind of thing. So movement from there to about 30 years later, I was living in New York City and I'd moved to New York. I have a degree in acting. I'm talking about AI technology because I'm an actor. Um, I was living in New York City. Um, I moved there in 87. This was 1994. I had started and run a theater company. That didn't work out financially. It was creatively awesome, but it was financially a disaster. Uh, and, and then I, because I'm smart, I decided to write myself an acting career. So I went into a two year period where I wrote seven feature length screenplays, started a fake management company because we didn't have agents. So, so we did that. Uh, we got good enough that we had to hire other actors and writers because it was weird. We were just sending out the same two people. <laughs> but I was doing desktop publishing as my day job. And um, I, I would see buses drive by with you know, these banners for Wired Magazine and Mondo 2000. There was something going on, there was this buzz. And the internet at the time, you actually had to dial up to it. Your, your phone called another computer, and then it was command line. There were these BBSs, bulletin board systems, where you could chat with people. But people started talking about this thing called the World Wide Web. And I started learning about it. And I'm like, but I can't do that. I'm an actor, right? You know. And I, and I started learning about it. And the more I learned about it, the more I realized how you structure a website is very, very similar to how you structure a screenplay. And I'd just written a bunch of screenplays. And so I thought, huh, maybe I can do something here. And so I had an idea. Maybe, maybe I've got, I know a lot of talented people. Maybe I put an art and culture magazine up on, on the World Wide Web, if I can figure it out. So I took my, my big Mac 660 AV computer and a 13-inch color monitor on vacation with my wife. There's laughs. Some people knew of these machines, these crazy machines. Um, and. I coded the first issue of Urban Desires. And it, this is what the internet looked like in 1994. You'll notice that the image is left justified. Why? Because the center tag didn't apply to images. Why would you want to center an image? <laughs> and this was the cover. I had some Photoshop skills, so I did the cover. We featured artists. We had a sex section, of course, because you had to. But, but it, it was an art and culture magazine. And you know the, the internet at the time was research papers and dissertations. And so I, I built this thing, and now I'm like, um, what do I do with this? And someone's like, oh, you got to upload it to a server. I'm like, what's a server? They're like, here's some computer in California. So I was like, OK, so. <laughs> For those of you that are young enough to not know what that is, you're awful people. <laughs> We could watch the internet type across our screen. It was so slow. <laughs> so I uploaded that the first week of December in 1994. Three weeks later, I got a note from someone that said, do you know that Urban Desires has been written about in Liberatio and the Parisian News Daily? I was like, no. <laughs> like, really? Um, cool. Uh, <laughs> I, I ran down to the international newsstand at Times Square. And I bought this paper and I flipped it open. And sure enough, in French, which I don't speak, there was a full page article of this thing. I had files I had sent to California from Paris. And in that moment, I realized that the world had just changed. 
And, and it was cool because, you know, in Times Square, there's all these people walking around. And what hit me was nobody knows it. The world is different. Geography's collapsed. Time is insignificant. Everything's going to be instant. You could kind of see in a moment, like once I had this epiphany, I knew what the web was. It wasn't about all the hype and bullshit that they talk about with the dot-com boom. It was about this is going to change everything. And it did. Um, so fast forward another almost 30 years from 1994 to last year. I was, I was digging deep into blockchain and NFT stuff, and that eventually flamed out. It was, like, it was interesting. The deeper I dug into that, the less real it felt. I like it conceptually, but it was a lot of bullshit projects. Um, but in that, I, I got um, involved in this project called Pixelmind, which was kind of this NFT-powered, it was like Mad Libs for image generation. They were using stable diffusion on the back end, but they, they did these series, and you basically just filled in a little Mad Libs kind of sentence, and this is one of the first images I created. And so they had cool metadata, like here was the prompts that I used, and you know, there's my account. But there's also, if you notice in the lower right-hand corner, for every image you created, there was a video of that image being created. And so you can kind of watch the machine making art. It was wild. I'm like, well, that's different. And for the next six months or so, I used Pixelmind to just create these images. I would sort of fill in these Mad Libs things. And I could turn them into NFTs. So I've got like 200 NFTs of these images I created. If you want to buy them, I'll sell them to you. <laughs> You're going to make a fortune. The Jerry Garcia one, that's going to be worth a fortune. But as I did this, you know, I would go through these phases. I'd make a bunch of images, then I'd go away for a month, then I'd make a bunch, then. But I kept thinking, like, what's the point? Like, like it was like a parlor trick almost, right? It was sexy, but like, what am I, what am I doing? And, but, like, the, the kind of ghosts of, of these, you know, luminaries, I put Musk up there just because he's literally launching rockets and you know, making electric cars possible. And I, like, I, kept, I kept having this feeling like, is this one of those? Is, is, this a, is this a thing? And so I taught myself this thing called stable diffusion, where you had to actually get virtual servers up and running. And I failed eight times. And every time I failed, I'd just get pissed off and I'd go away for a week. And I'm like, no, but I think I got to learn these things. And so I learned it. And then I learned about this thing called Dream Booth, where you could upload like 20 images of yourself and it would learn who you were and then you could create these images there was a a, a trend in november where um you know people did the facebook the ai selfies right from that thing lenza this was right before that so i'm putting up these images and i'm like huh i kind of want to see that movie like oh i you know i kind of want to know his story like yeah i might look like that someday um <laughs> And then something hit me. You know, a creative trick, if you're overwhelmed with too much creative choice, is you narrow the focus. And so I thought, what if I told these stories? I've got some writing skills. So, so I took, uh, you know, this dude. I don't know why it's a little dim there. But I wrote, I wrote a little story for him, like just a little snippet of his life. And so it begins. There was a time until very recently where you had to live life to experience it, right? So this guy's just living his life in the, in the metaverse. And, and so I created an Instagram channel called Kyle Shannon Dreams. And you know I put up all these characters and wrote their stories. And then I thought, well, I kind of want to know more. I want to start to see the movie, right? And I'm like, I'm an actor. I can figure this out. So against all better judgment, I took about four hours one night. And I learned enough about TikTok, because <laughs> I'm an influencer, to figure out how to do it. And so, so I, I didn't quite know how to animate anything, but I used you know, their motion uh, filters and stuff like that and a little bit of talking skills. And this was the, uh, the first TikTok that I did for Kyle Shannon Dreams TikTok. And so it begins. There was a time until very recently where you had to live life to experience it. That time has passed. I now lead a life beyond explanation. I am immersed in a dreamscape so grand it defies all logic. These images are the artifacts of my existence. Welcome to my life. Welcome to my dream. Right? Kind of cool. I thought, ah, this is this this could be a thing. Like all of a sudden, I'm kind of 
operating and executing a level, a level of creative execution that, that the output was much higher than my input effort, right? And I was starting to, to, to feel this thing that, huh, these tools are doing something more, right? Something different. And then this day happened. And I think this day is the day that actually changes everything. I think this is the turning point. I think this is the day we'll look back and say, this is when it all started. November 30th, 2022 is the day that ChatGPT was released. So I've been kind of playing with these images and, um, and ChatGPT comes out and I had played with OpenAI's playground. The, the interesting thing about ChatGPT is that GPT-3 was launched, I think a year and a half before this, this was released. So you could play with this stuff. And in fact, the, the instructions for how to create ChatGPT were in the documentation for GPT-3. And Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, assumed someone would create ChatGPT and no one did. So in whatever it was, the beginning of November, Microsoft was about to announce their billion dollar investment. And Sam Altman said to his dev team, you got two weeks, whip up a, this ChatGPT thing. They built that in two weeks. So if it seems janky, that's why. <laughs> um, I think that we are entering a great renaissance. And, and yeah, AI is in the word renaissance, isn't that? I, I, that just blows my mind. I think it, it had to be there. That's one of those words, like when, when I was in acting school, how do you spell renaissance? Like, why is there an I in here? You know, it screwed me up every time. Now we know why. Um, yeah. So, so I'm gonna give, I'm gonna geek out a little bit. ChatGPT, I'm gonna give you a little bit of history, some milestones that I think are important. I, I was gonna demo a bunch of stuff today, but I'm, I'm actually gonna go in a bit of a geekier direction. I really want you to understand how these tools work because there's a lot of misconceptions about them. I hopefully will inspire you to start using them, but, but I, I think it's really important to understand them. 2017, Google writes this paper called uh, Attention is All You Need. They, they, they released this thing called a transformer. And a transformer, all you need to know about it is AI up to this point, you could only train it on relatively small data sets. The transformer made it possible that you could sort of point these machines at massive data sets. So that you need to know. The other thing that's interesting to know is Google invented the thing that is now threatening their business. And I personally think that they hid it because they knew it was gonna threaten their business and they didn't wanna do it to themselves, which was probably stupid. 2020, they released GPT-3. This was the first of these GPT models that actually kind of worked and, and started, started to hit on, on a different level. November 22nd, they release it. Just to put things in context, my World Wide Web epiphany, all the groovy stuff with the web, to get to 100 million users, the World Wide Web took eight years. Chat GPT, two months. Two months to 100 million users. So. If you're thinking, oh, I'll get around to AI, I've got a couple of years, I actually don't think you do. It is hard for me to express how quickly things are moving. I have a newsletter, I can't, I have a newsletter and I can't keep up with what's happening. I'm paying attention to this stuff all the time. So that's, what, that's what's happening. How many people here have used ChatGPT? Great. How many use it a lot? How many have not used it? And it, yeah, please. How many have not even heard of it? Two, okay, great, okay. Um, so let's talk about what it is. It kind of looks like I'm thirsty. <laughs> I just realized my throat was closing up. I'm like, ah! Um, it kind of looks like a Google search bar. It's just a, just a box and you can type anything in it. Right? Seems simple enough. Like you could type in what's so special about ChatGPT in an M&M wrap. <laughs> and it will just do it. <laughs> You're welcome. I am going to spare you rapping. <laughs> but it rhymes. It actually does the stuff. You can have it do quantum physics. It's actually really fun to do these kind of parlor tricks. Right? Make me a poem, write me a song, do it. Eh, eh, eh. But where I had the real epiphany, epiphany with this was I thought, you know, I've got some stuff that I'm working on at work. Let me, let me 
try something. And the first thing I did was I, I had started this thing called the AI Salon. I'll give you information about it at the end. And I thought, oh, I wanna, I wanna market this thing, so could you help me create a marketing plan? Boom, it wrote a marketing plan. And then I was like, oh, but it said paid media. Yeah, I don't have any money. Sorry about that. Um, I, I, uh, actually, you know what, can you, can you make me a table that compares paid media with earned media? And what are the advantages of that? And boom, it created a table. And it does this in seconds. Like I didn't give it much more than like make me a table comparing those two things, and it did that. And then at one point, I had it write an email, and I was going to put the email in a template, but it looked crappy. So I was like, oh, I need that in HTML, but I haven't done HTML since the 90s, so I don't know how to do that anymore. So I asked it to make me a pretty email in HTML, and it wrote the HTML code. My big epiphany was ChatGPT in a 90-minute session, never having written a line of Python. I wrote a complete application that took someone's input about a topic and generated five social media outputs in 90 minutes. I still haven't written a line of Python. I wrote a functional application. Um, for my company, Storyvine, we were looking at how can we create personas for, um, uh, for, for we work in healthcare and pharma, and, and sometimes they can't find patients. So, so I thought maybe we could do, you know, synthesize patients and tell stories that way. And it, it kind of creeped me out. My company, Storyvine, is all about human beings telling their stories. So I didn't really want to synthesize a human, but I'm like, let me just see where this is. So I had ChatGPT teach me how to make personas. Then I had to write a dozen of them. Uh, then I had the persona answer a set of story prompts. So this person told her story about her, I think, MS diagnosis or something like that. Um, and then I have a friend who's a photographer that's the co-host of the salon with me. Um, she made me an image of Amina. That woman doesn't actually exist. That was made in mid-journey. And then I took that image and that story and I went into some of the synthesizing software and I created some little video clips of Amina telling her story and I put them in a Storyvine template which kind of auto-edits these things together. So in a space of about, like this wasn't, weeks worth of work. This was about 20 minutes. So let's say 30 tops. In about 30 minutes, I went from, huh, wonder if I can do this, to this. Hello, I'm Amina Ahmed. I was diagnosed with ALS about four years ago. What brings me joy is spending time with my family, especially my parents and siblings. We enjoy cooking and eating traditional South Asian dishes together. Moving beyond my diagnosis was not easy. I'm going to stop it right there just in the spirit of time. Um, I want to get going. So freaky, right? Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And it's like, this is as bad as it's ever going to be, right? This still doesn't look human, but there are tools out there that are going to be able to analyze the text and figure out where do I need to whisper? Where do I need to raise my voice? Where might I get emotionally? So these things are going to get very real very, very quickly. So again, this wasn't, I didn't ever work at Industrial Light and Magic. There was no 3D meshing. This was just uploading some files into some tools, pasting in some text, and say build. Um, whoops, I went backwards. Oh no, we have to meet Amina again. <laughs> we'll go quick. Um, just show of hands, how many people are completely freaked out? How many people are completely excited? How many people are both? I think that's the right answer, by the way. OK. Um, when photography was invented, this painter, Paul Delaroche, said when he saw the first daguerreotype, from today, painting is dead. If your fear is, whatever I do is dead, it's not, but what I can promise you is it is absolutely different. And it's absolutely different, and no one knows it yet. Well, some 100 million people do for ChatGPT. Um, but this stuff is coming way faster than I think any of us are prepared for. Um, painting didn't die, but it changed. Photography started out as this thing. Oh, well, photography isn't real art. That took a couple of <laughs> centuries, for, for, or you know, century and a half for that to, to, to be acknowledged as an art form. So I think we're in very similar kind of territory. I want to talk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go down a geeky rabbit hole here. Um, 
I want you to understand how these tools work because one of the perceptions is, is that AI is copying and pasting words and it's copying and pasting part of artists' images and it's montaging them together and it's stealing. It's not. Now, it's based on um, data that other people have created. That part's true. But understanding how these things actually work, I think, is important. So we're going to learn about ChatGPT. GPT, what's it stand for? Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. This is about as technical as it gets. Um, generative, it generates stuff. Pre-trained, you don't have to have your own data set. This was pre-trained on all of the internet, essentially. It's amazing. Um, Transformer is just that tool that means we can train it on all of the internet, but that's what that term means. Large language model is what these tools are. It's many words in a model. It's good, right? Latent space. Oh, no, I said it wouldn't get more geeky. It's going to get one step more geeky. So what ends up happening is these, these machines, this is for chat GPT we're learning about. These machines learn all the words and what they mean. And then it turns every word into a series of numbers that live on an XY plot. So this is a two-dimensional plot. These models in reality are thousands of dimensions. This is a two-dimensional, I'm doing it dramatically oversimplified. But all those dots are like clusters of words in, you know, semantically related, meaning related. Um, and then based on your prompt, the large language model predicts the single next word in its response to give you your answer. It's, it's like, when you learn what happens, it's even more remarkable what it does. So if, if the prompt is, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy blank, what could it be? Well, it's probably an animal, it's probably, right? The, the model essentially says, okay, I'm not gonna look at anything that's not in this, you know, semantic region. And there's all the dots of words that, you know, or numbers that, that might um, be relevant. And one of those is gonna have the highest probability of being the right word. And then that thing is a long string of numbers. And then there's a table that says, what word is that connected to? Dog. And then it sticks dog in that spot. So when it's responding with like the whole marketing plan, it's doing it one word at a time, generating it from the ground up. It's, it's generating original content. Let's look at pictures. It, this is even more remarkable. This is like, how this, who figured this out? <laughs> You take your large language model that understands the words and you connect that to a thing called a diffusion model. And what they do is they take every image that's tagged. So it might be, the tag might be there's a cat or in this one there's a house and there's trees and there's whatever it is. So, so they tag this image and then they, they, they noise it. They, they noisify it. They make it this random noise image. And then based on your prompt, the LLM figures out the word part of it, and then back to this latent space thing, our prompt for this image is cat on a desk. I'm not that creative, so what do you want from me? And so it kind of knows, these are all the cat images. These are the images that have been tagged cat. These are all the images that have been tagged desk. Now they're all, all the images are not actually images. They're these random noise things tied to a number. And it then averages them into a single noisy image. And then over 20 to 50 to 70 steps, it denoises the image to create a truly original image that's never existed before. So it actually doesn't know what's in there. It's literally just a mathematical formula. It's wild, right? Mind blown? More people mind blown? <laughs> yeah. Um, how am I doing? I've got a minute left. OK, oh, good. I'm, I'm kind of at the end. Feel free to take pictures. I will also get this deck to the team so that, that these will be available. Um, OK, this is a lot. There, again, things are moving so fast. For, yeah. Oh. They're very saucy up front here. OK. Um, so from this list, here's my recommendation. If you've used it a lot, used it a little, like seriously. The, like my, my prayer is that you leave this room and start playing with this stuff. I think it's actually really important. Um, I would take one from column one, one from column two, and then go learn the stuff in column three about prompting. Learn about prompting. For images, that top one, the prompt book, 
thing is remarkable. What these models understand about, <laughs> I'm gonna stop. Um, okay, yeah. So, um, but, but your, your GPT, there's a bunch of different versions of GPT you can play with. There's a bunch of different image things. Midjourney, in my opinion, is by far the, the, the kind of sexiest, it's the highest quality, but you have to it, you, you, um, create the images within Discord, so you kind of need to know Discord, and it's a bit of a pain in the ass. Some of the other ones, you don't need to know technically. The bottom one, Lexica, is like an image search engine where you can just search for images, and then when you click on an image, it shows you what prompt made that up. So you can literally just copy and paste prompts and go make your own. Um, on, the, on the video music and voice synthesis side, I started making a list, and I'm like, I can't. So just go to futurepedia.com. They're keeping track of all this stuff. There's thousands of these things in there by now. Um, the salon that I mentioned is the salon.ai. We meet bi-weekly. If you're interested in this stuff, it, we meet online and in person. Um, Jane's here. She, I met her here at Creative Mornings, and she's now one of the organizers at the salon. And that's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions if we have time. But... Keep that going for Kyle.